lecture series titled On Love and How to Find It. First class is going to be called The Third Thing, or in German, Die Dritte Sache. And in just a moment, I'll explain to you what Die Dritte Sache is, but I think it's probably the most important thing when it comes to love. So, just a very brief plug. This is going to be a 12-week lecture series, which means that every Monday for the next three months, I'm going to be hosting a one-hour class. Starting next week, Jeneline will be back. She'll be hosting this class together with me. And the idea is that every single week, we're going to delve into different theories of love, different philosophical reflections on the idea of love and what it means. And my goal is that by the end of these three months, you will have found a wide plethora catalog of different ideas and approaches to the universal theme of love. And hopefully that will be enjoying and enriching to you um, as it has been to me. I mean, reading about it thus far. And I know it's, it's almost a little bit weird to talk about love with other people because there's a great line from the author Haruki Murakami he says that the two things a man should never talk about in public are his diet and his love life. Now, I'll spare you the details of my diet and perhaps also of my love life, but I think that we should actually talk more about love. And then we should have a more open communication about what it means to love and to be loved. And so my goal for the next 12 weeks, for the next three months, every Monday morning, is to dedicate an entire hour to the exploration of the philosophical and psychoanalytic themes of love and to hopefully elevate and raise our discussion and our discourse on what it means to love and be loved, which is after all the whole point of being alive. At least I believe it is. If you are someone who has loved, if you are someone who has lost, the famous quote, better to have loved and lost than not have loved at all, hopefully this will also provide you a source of comfort and perhaps some wisdom and reflection if you are somebody who has not yet found love, I hope that this class will be soothing and comforting and will prepare you for that wonderful and painful, miraculous journey that is to be in love. Anyway, we're going to start in just a moment. My final plug is that even though all of these lectures are going to be 100% free and open access, because I don't want to put the good stuff behind a paywall. I think all of these lectures should be open access because the true gift is getting to share it with you guys. That's what animates me. That's what makes me happy. However, if you would like to have the full course, if you'd like to be able to download the audio for each of these lectures, if you'd like to have digital access to the transcripts, if you'd like to eventually purchase the ebook, and if you'd like to join our bonus Q&A podcast, which I record every single week after the class, which you can also download, please consider supporting these classes on Patreon. Um, starts at just $5 a month. But basically, if you're interested in joining this course, then that is the way to have the full package. You can join every week for free. I'll save these classes so that even if you're late for the class, you can join it. You can watch it later. It'll be saved on Instagram and YouTube. I really want it to be open access. It's very important to me. I don't think that we should make education something that you have to go broke for. On the other hand, if you believe in my dream of open access education and you share it and you would like to support these lectures and keep me going and support my book buying habit, <laughs> then please do consider joining our learning community on Patreon. We have patrons from around the world. Um, I like to think that we are probably the most inclusive and respectful and just sort of genuinely passionate learning community on the internet and the Patreon. There's a link in my bio. It starts at just $5 a month. And if you'd like to join our classes and get the full amount out of them, the digital downloads for every lecture and the transcripts and also the bonus podcast or have the opportunity to ask me questions in the Q&A, which I will then answer for you on the podcast, please do consider joining the Patreon makes a world of difference. Um, it means I can keep doing this and that makes me so incredibly happy and grateful because it's crazy that I get to basically do this, that I get to have this community with you guys where I can just spend all of my time reading and writing and thinking and sharing ideas with you. It is 
insanely, insanely cool. I feel super lucky. So if you'd like to join for the entire course, this is my last plug, head over to Patreon. Um, it's www.patreon.com dash Jen, Lane, and Julian, or click the link in bio. It starts at $5 a month, and I very much look forward to welcoming you there. Um, okay. On that note, we are going to be starting in just a moment. Do you guys want more light? I don't know if it's too dark. Is that better? A little bit better? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Let us begin. On love and how to find it, lecture series starts now. One of my absolute all-time favorite ideas about love comes from a very unlikely source, namely the German poet Bertolt Brecht. Now, Bertolt Brecht is an unlikely source for an inspirational quote about love because Bertolt Brecht was inherently suspicious of anything sentimental. In fact, the whole point of Bertolt Brecht's theater and his lyric poetry was to undermine sentimentality. For example, one of Brecht's famous techniques was to essentially pull you out of the action. There would be a scene on stage, and as soon as you started feeling a bit weak, someone would show up on stage with a placard that said, don't forget, this is just a play. And so Bertolt Brecht had this idea that we should always undermine and be suspicious of manipulation when it came to theater, when it came to media, when it came to the way in which emotions were transferred to us. He found the idea of sharing ideas about love to be innately suspicious. And that's the rest of poems has what, to my mind, is actually one of the most truthful observations about love that I've ever seen. It certainly has been true in my life. And it's not just about love between partners. It's also about love between parents and their children and how you sustain that over time, which is not easy. And Bertolt Brecht calls this die dritte Sache, which translates to the third thing. And his basic argument, his basic idea, is that love is not enough. That love has to be cultivated. This is a line from another German poet from 150 years before that, Goethe, who said that love is not domination, love is cultivation, which means that in order to have a relationship with someone, in order to be in love, you have to have not just equanimity, which isn't the same thing as being the same, right? This is one of my favorite quotes. You may have already heard this. This is from one of Tolstoy's works where he says that love isn't about being compatible. Love is about managing incompatibility. And how do you manage that incompatibility Two people who are fundamentally not alike, who seem to enjoy spending time together? Well, at first it's love. At first you think love is the thing that unites us. And yet, as anybody knows, love changes over time. Love has different chapters. It's another, sorry to keep like quoting things, but like there's another really great goods line where he says that the only way to know a great work of art is to have seen it evolve. The same for any relationship, because relationship, if you will, is the idea of sticking it out with one person. That the sign of a great relationship is to have a love that has evolved. And so the evolution of love is what we call a relationship. And it's precisely great love that is often the result of this kind of relationship, which means that it's an act of cultivation. And so how do you cultivate a quote-unquote great love over time? Because surely you can't simply sustain it by means of pure passion. The spark of love isn't necessarily the same thing after five years, after ten years, etc. 
And so Bertolt Brecht says that the only way to sustain love is by finding die dritte Sache, the third thing. And the third thing is something that you and your partner have in common. and something that you share. This can be a project, this can be an ambition, for some people it's children. Die dritte Sache is the thing that makes love real. This is actually something really important that people don't always see in the Brecht code. Brecht isn't making a cynical judgment about love. He's not saying love isn't real and you have to find something to pretend it's real. He's not saying people who have children no longer love each other, but they stay together for the child. Instead, Brecht is making a much more metaphysical argument. If you will, it's even a dialectical argument about the fact that love always appears too late. Love always appears through its own negation. Now, what does that mean? It means that when you're in love, love isn't necessarily something that you can put your finger on. After all, this is something that Lacan already knew, the French psychoanalyst Lacan. He said that one of the most dangerous things you can do to ask somebody, do me. And I would add to that that perhaps even more dangerous is to add a little word, which is, do you really love me? Because as soon as you ask someone, do you love me? There's two traps you fall into. Trap number one, if they say yes, then you immediately think, are you just saying yes because I asked, right? Maybe you're just saying yes because you feel pressured. You're dodging the question. Now I no longer trust you and you're in this bind, which is I wanted to feel loved by you, so I asked you. I wanted you to make me stop worrying and stop feeling anxious and needy. And now you've given me the answer that I thought I wanted. Yes, I love you. And now I feel more anxious. That's trap number one when it comes to the question, do you love me? Trap number two is, if you ask someone, do you really love me? You're basically asking them to prove their love to you, which is an inherently impotent, impossible gesture. Because as soon as you start having to quantify love, you start losing the quality of love. As soon as you start having to list somebody's lovable features, you've already abstracted what that love is because you don't just love people for the good things about them. Often we love things for we love things in people that drive us kind of crazy. There's a great scene from for the younger the younger ones amongst you may not know this, but there's a great scene in one of the best romantic comedies of all time, which was written by Nora Ephron. It's called When Harry Met Sally. And the clot spoilers for Harry Met Sally, by the way. When Harry Met Sally. Or Sally Met Harry. Whatever. At the end of the movie, when Harry declares his love to Sally, someone, they both pretend that they were just friends. He says, I love you. And there's all these things that you do that I think are crazy, that drive me off the wall. And yet I love you. That's why I love you. It's not because of all these amazing things that you do. It's not because you're more attractive than other people. It's not because you're smarter than other people. It's not because you have some kind of secret. There are all these things that you do that I don't understand and that somehow I find tantalizingly fascinating. I love you. I don't love you because of X. I love you. And her response is probably one of the best responses in a love scene in cinematic history. I absolutely love it. Her response is, I hate you. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And then they kiss. And it's a beautiful scene because, of course, she doesn't really hate him. What she hates is having to love him. What she hates is that love has happened to her. That she resisted it because love isn't necessarily convenient. They had a beautiful friendship, as it were. And yet, love came barging through an open door. And so she says, I hate you. And they kiss. 
And this is exactly, to my mind, the most honest depiction of romantic love I've ever seen in the cinema. Remember, Brecht always said that whenever there's something sentimental, we should be suspicious. Whenever there's sentimentality in the theater or on TV or in, in movies, sort of an overwhelming outpouring of love. Oh, I love you so much. I love you to the end of the world. And, you know, the most beautiful person who's ever existed. And then they kiss and there's like a bombastic cinematic embrace. I find that that's not really love to me. That's what people wish love would look like. It's what children think love is. It's the hero rescuing the princess and kissing at the end of the end of the movie. Love is a lot more like saying I love you and you do all these things that drive me crazy and somehow I shouldn't love you, but I do. And then the other person saying, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, which is why I love you. There's a great expression in Dutch, which is, I'm talking about when Harry met Sally. There's a great expression in Dutch, which is ik haat van je, which means I hate of you. Now, of course, look, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to excuse toxic relationships. We shouldn't punish people we're in a relationship with. Love isn't punishment. Sartre, you know, Sartre had a typically twisted view on love, which is unsurprising considering his own relationship with Simone de Beauvoir. He said that the definition of true love is that two people can torture each other like nobody else. That love is inherently about conflict. And that when you're lovers, you simply have better weapons in that conflict. Now, of course, there's some truth to that, right? Because when you're in love, you're vulnerable. What it means to be in love is to say that you are exposing yourself. That's, that's why we hate falling in love sometimes, because even if it works out, it means the potential for pain increases dramatically. This is a great line from the German philosopher Adorno on love. He says that, Geliebt wird man nur, wo man schwach sich zeigen kann which translates to you are only loved when you can show weakness. But there's also one key thing that I left out there. He says, Geliebt wirst nur, wenn du schwach dich zeigen kannst, ohne Kraft zu provozieren. Which means you are only loved where you can show weakness without provoking strength. And what he means by that is that when you're in love and when the other person loves you, you can show yourself to be vulnerable. You don't have to always show yourself at your best. You can show yourself at your worst. You can basically tell your partner about your fears without fearing them. And he says that to really be in love means that you can express yourself in a vulnerable manner. You don't have to wear a mask or put on a facade. And the other person shouldn't judge you for it. They shouldn't punish you for it. If the other person sees an opening and they stab you in that opening, then it's not love. And so love is the process by which you can be more human, right? You can be more fully true to yourself precisely by means by being vulnerable to somebody else, which means that when you're in love and when you're in a relationship, like I said, the potential for pain increases quite a bit. And we'll get back to that in a moment because I think everybody here has shared that pain. There's different types of pain in love, something that Plato already talked about in the symposium, which we'll get to next week. There's the pain of unrequited love, the idea that somebody doesn't love you back. There's the pain of loving somebody, but worrying that you love them more than they love you. Also not very pleasant. Stephen Fry, well-known British essayist and actor, said that perhaps his most valuable lesson in life when it came to love had been not unrequited love, but unrequited love within a relationship. Namely, to be in love and to realize that two people never love each other equally. Which isn't to say that one person loves the other person more, but it's to say that people love each other differently. And so the anxiety goes back to what we talked about a couple minutes ago, how dangerous the question is, do you really love me? Because when you say, do you really love me? You're assuming that they love in the same way that you do. And so one of the most important lessons about love is that people love differently. And that sometimes people think they love the other person more. And yet, 
love is not a competition. Love is repetition. Love is something where I love you differently each and every day. I won't cease loving you. I don't love you more one day and less the other. My love isn't about proving to you that I love you. My love is the thing that you can count on without having to count it. That's essentially what love is. It's not something that you have to prove. It's something you have to repeat. And so Stephen Fry, the actor and essayist, he said that one of the most painful lessons in life had also been one of the most important, which was that unrequited love isn't necessarily something that exists on the same way on both sides of love. If you love someone, they don't love you back. It's unrequited. It's painful. It sucks. You have to embrace the suck. If you're in a relationship and you worry that the other person doesn't love you, that's even more painful. And then maybe there's a third kind of pain that we experience in love, which is what the writer Stefan Zweig points out. Stefan Zweig says that perhaps one of the most unlikely and yet burning sensations of pain within love isn't to fall into unrequited love, nor is it to lose love, but it's to be the object of love. He says that it's painful when somebody else loves you, but you don't love them. That you see that there's a passion and a fire burning in their heart for you. And a bucket of water and you want to throw it over that fire. And yet you know that by doing so, by dousing their flame, that you will hurt them. Of course, this can happen in a relationship as well. You realize that you are no longer in love and you don't want to hurt the other person because there is no winning in love. In the same way that when you're in a relationship, you, you never win an argument. It's not possible. Again, it's not a competition. Even if you think you win an argument, you've lost. In the same way that if you realize you don't love the other person anymore and you douse their flame, you've lost because you've hurt them. And so Stefan Zweig says that the third way in which we feel pain in love is when someone else loves us, but we don't love them. Um, which seems like a luxury problem, but a very painful predicament, I think, to be in. Now, of course, we'll talk more about this in the next couple of classes. For example, I think a lot of people, a lot of people, especially when they're young, what they fear more than not being loved is being alone. And so I think a lot of people start relationships with people when they're not in love with that person and they hope that love will come by itself. And then the longer they are in those relationships, the harder it gets to exit because the more pain they will inflict upon their partner. And so love can be a trap. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that love isn't dangerous. Love is a risky proposition. This is one of the key differences between a crush and love. It's actually a German word for a crush that within psychoanalytic concepts, it's called Verliebtheit. And Verliebtheit is not the same thing as Liebe. Because I've said this in a clip before, a crush belongs to you. A crush is safe. A crush is something that you don't really have to worry about them hurting you because they probably don't even know you. And so a crush doesn't have to be a bad thing. A crush can be something that teaches you how to love. Because often when we, when we first discover love, it's very intense. Everything changes. This is also Zizek's theory of love. I'll get there in a minute. And so sometimes it's good to have training wheels for love. And a crush can be like training wheels for love. You can experience the delight of it and the pain of it and the sleepless nights of it. But at the same time, you're not going to fall on her. And so a crush can be safe. But a crush isn't the same thing as being in love, necessarily. It's different. Not worse, not better, just different. It's the difference between Verliebtheit and Liebe. By the way, someone asked if this is being recorded. I uh, just want to very quickly say that yes, I'm going to save this for free on Instagram and YouTube. But if you'd like to download it as a podcast, if you'd like to get the edited transcript. If you'd like to be a part of the entire course,
please do consider joining on Patreon. It starts at just $5 a month. There's a link in my bio. Okay, so we're unpacking a whole bunch of ideas here about love. Remember, I started by saying that for Lacan, the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, the most dangerous question in the world is, do you really love me? And do you love me? And before that, we talked about the fact that Brecht said that in order to love, to, or to sustain love, you need to have a third thing. And I very much believe this is true. The thing. And it doesn't have to be anything concrete. It can be abstract. For example, for love to be successful, it needs to have a perspective. It means you have to be able to dream with somebody. You have to have something to live for. If you only live for the other person, not only are you making yourself vulnerable to a lot of pain, but you're almost asking to be hurt. Because one of the central maxims about love is that you can't ask the other person to complete, do, complete you. You can only ask them to accept you. But in an ideal situation, two people accept each other, and then what? You can't just sit around accepting each other. Although if you do it without clothes on, it's probably pretty enjoyable. And so you need to have a third thing. You need to have something that binds you together. And a lot of people think that this third thing is something that you share, right? Like, oh, we both like Star Wars or something. Not a bad start. But a third thing isn't just a passion that you have in common. A third thing isn't a similarity. In fact, I would almost argue that the third thing that stains love is almost a different. It's that it brings you together in a manner where you enrich each other instead of just complementing each other. I think that, and I don't know exactly who said this, it might have been, it's not Plato, I think it's one of the earlier thinkers, said that a sign of true love, I believe this 100%, is that the other person taught you something. In my case, there's so many things that my partner has taught me. Because believe it or not, I couldn't until a couple of years ago because I grew up in Europe where I had a bicycle and didn't want to pay money on a car, let alone expensive classes to learn how to drive. And so she taught me how to drive. But she also taught me so many other things. She taught me compassion. She taught me how to deal with parents. She taught me how to try to be a better partner every day, frankly. And so love is about education. It's something I believe very deeply, that love should teach you something. This is also, again, why a crush is important. A crush teaches you how to love, but love is going to teach you all the other things, if you see what I mean. And so love becomes a universal vehicle for learning. And some of those lessons can be hard and painful, but many of those lessons are beautiful. And so let's talk about something slightly more technical here. I want to bring in Zizek's theory of love and Lacan's theory of love. If you know anything about Slavoj Zizek, most of his theories are Lacanian in nature. He usually takes a metaphysical argument from Kant or Hegel, and he combines it with a psychoanalytic concept from Jacques Lacan. Now, Zizek has a theory of love that I think is very valid. He says that love is not convenient. He says that love disrupts. It's the ultimate disrupting force. Which is funny, isn't it? Because we think about love as, you know, love is what unites us and love brings us together and world peace, etc. But it's not really the case. First of all, on a very basic common sense level, many acts of war, crimes are committed because of love. There's a line from G.K. Chesterton that I find slightly problematic. He says that the sign of a good soldier is that he hates what he fights against, but that he loves for what he fights for. I think he says it like he, he doesn't hate the man in front of him, but he loves the person behind his back or something like this. And that's true, of course, right? Otherwise, you're a soulless monster who simply exists on, on hate. And yes, as Finn said in Star Wars, it's more important to fight to protect what you hold dear than to fight against the thing you hate. I 100% agree. But what makes it slightly problematic is that the best way to convince people to hate something or someone 
is precisely to convince them that they're a threat to the things you love and hold dear, whether it's your nation, whether it's your religion, whether it's your family, whether it's your loved one. And so love and hate can have a very close relationship. It's, it's a very dangerous thing to love. And it's a very dangerous thing to be manipulated when it comes to love. This is what in psychoanalytic theories is called transference. One of the central insights of French and German psychoanalysis is the fact that hate isn't necessarily the opposite of love, that I think everybody can relate to this. Sometimes when we love someone very dearly, we don't treat them necessarily in a lovable way, that we end up hurting them or nagging them, even though we don't want to. And think about it, people who you don't love, you don't even have the time to hurt them or to nag them because you're indifferent to them. We don't spend a lot of time thinking about other people necessarily. But we think about the people we love. And so there's this idea about transference that I find super relatable that really helped me a lot in my own life. And it's basically about the relationship between a parent and a child, especially when a parent nags a child. Now, most parents, not true for everyone, most parents love their children. Let's just say that that's true, right? But not all parents are good at, good at expressing that love. In fact, many parents are bad at it. Many different reasons why. Maybe they weren't loved in a way that was understandable to them when they were children. But when parents love their child, they also want affection back from their child. It's about reciprocity. And the thing that a parent feel, fears most is losing the affection or the love of their child. And it puts parents in a very difficult headspace. Because if the goal of being a good parent is to raise an independent child who doesn't need you, then being a successful parent also means losing the thing you love most. Again, this is why you need the third thing. If you raise a child to be independent, that means they're independent of you. They don't need you to survive. They don't rely upon you for everything. And so you have to be a person who can survive by themselves. And yet, secretly, most parents still want their children to be dependent, to need them. They think that need is love. And so you have to reinvent your relationship with your parent, right? You have to find a third thing, something that binds you together. You can't just guilt trip a child into loving you. You can't just say, I put X amount of money and time into raising you. Now you have to love me. Because that's not how love works. Then you worry that the child is just taking care of you or spending time with you because they feel obliged to. Love is not an obligation. Love has to be spontaneous. And so parents are afraid. They're afraid that their child won't love them because they've raised them to be independent. And anybody who's gone through, this is like a scene you recognize from any movie. It's like a parent asks a child, how is school? And the child just sort of shrugs. Because the child is learning to be independent. The child is having independent experiences, some of which are difficult, some of which are enjoyable. And one of the first lessons of independence is that you, you don't have to share everything with your parent, that you have your own self. You're starting to learn to wear a mask. And a parent sees that and is proud of the child, but also fearful. And so the parent asks the child, how was school? What did you do today? And the child doesn't want to say. The child no longer wants to communicate. And so the parent starts worrying about losing the child, losing the child's affection. So what the parent will do is that a parent will then say, well, if I can't get affection from you, if I can't get a hug from you, if you suddenly don't want to touch me anymore, the parent will basically resort to a lesser kind of attention which is much more guaranteed. 
usually relating to anger. And how do you provoke anger in a child? By nagging them or accusing them. And so often, and this is one of the central principles of transference within psychoanalysis, a parent will antagonize the child because they fear losing the child. And it's so painful, it's mind-blowingly stupid if you think about it, which is that we worry about losing the child. And so we act in precisely a manner in which the child will want to run away. And this is something I think we do throughout. It's like sometimes we chase something so hard that we don't realize that the chase is what's making it run away. And that runs throughout love. The more you want to be in a relationship, the more you're signaling to other people that you want to be loved, the less likely you are to be loved. You appear desperate and needy. The more, I used to see this all the time with my friends growing up, they, they obsess about girlfriends, but they didn't really want to talk about love. They worried that unless they had a girlfriend, they would appear unlovable. That unless they had a date, it would seem like they had no social value. Many of my friends would talk to me about the fact that unless they had multiple partners in quick succession, they didn't feel like they would find the one. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Experience is good. And at the same time, this wasn't about love, this was about fear. It was a way of not being vulnerable. It's interesting because I think often when two people meet each other, it's easier to say, this is just a fling. Because, oh my gosh, it would be very inconvenient if you were actually in love. Because that's a lot riskier. And that's how we get back to Zizek's theory of love. Zizek's theory of love is that love is inconvenient. It's a disrupting force. It comes like a lightning bolt from the sky and it just tears right through your heart. And Jizek says that one of the painful things about love, even if you're not in a relationship, just being in love, is that things that used to be satisfying no longer really are. Once you fall in love, you want to be with that person. You start doing crazy things to put yourself in a situation to be with that person. The craziest thing I ever did when I was a teenager to have a conversation with my crush after high school was to pretend like I had a flat tire on my bicycle halfway through, knowing that the other person would stop and see that I had a flat tire. And I was hoping that they would stop and say, can I help you pump your bicycle? <laughs> Not a euphemism. And what happened? Of course, she just blew by me. <laughs> Did not stop even for a moment. When we're in love, we create all of these ridiculous scenarios where we try to insinuate ourselves into the lives of somebody else. And it's a maddening experience. Plato in a symposium writes about the fact that love is a kind of madness. It doesn't make you act in a more rational way. Before falling in love, you're fine. You're basically self-sufficient. And then you fall in love and you start doing stupid things like letting the air out of your own tire just because you hope the other person will stop and have a chat with you. Love is madness in that way. But of course, life is madness, if you think about it. And so Zizek says that when you fall in love, ordinary things that used to make you happy are suddenly empty, hollow. It's like the world went from being in full color to being in black and white. You used to think that the height of satisfaction was to wake up in the morning and have a bowl of cereal while watching television, like anime or whatever, like I used to. And suddenly you've fallen in love and you're sitting there and you're crunching your cereal and you're watching your favorite show and secretly you feel like something is lacking. That's love. And it's annoying, isn't it? 
go back to when Harry met Sally. She says, I hate you. I hate falling in love with you. This is some troublesome. And that's a sign of true love for me is the inconvenience of it all. I think if love is too convenient, if love is something that happens to you and you're just like, okay, then it's almost less fulfilling. I think that love is something that demands sacrifices. And if you're wise and you're smart about it, as soon as you fall in love, you think, okay, here we go. We better buckle in. Now, I think there's extent of love relates to law. And here's how. Lacan has a famous aphorism about love that is typically Lacanian in that it's easy to misunderstand or not understand at all. And Lacan says that we love the lack in the other, which he then links to something even more confusing, which he says that love is giving what you don't have to someone who doesn't want it. Okay, let's unpack that. Lacan being cryptic, as per usual. When Lacan says something you don't have, he's alluding to one of his own concepts, which is the idea of lack, or manque in French. Now, lack is precisely this feeling of missing something, of needing something. And yet there's a difference between needing something and being needy. Think about it. There's a difference between desire and manufactured desire. There are things that we innately want. Love, affection. There are things that we are told to want. Expensive cars and fancy clothes. And Lacan says that our lack what we think we're missing is in fact constitutive, which is another way of saying that it's actually related to our drive. That there would be no drive without lack. That there would be no drive without desire. That the idea that you think you are missing something is the precondition for having something. That's pretty obvious in a materialistic sense, but he also means it in an existential sense, which is that it's very hard to be anything. Remember the Hamlet thing, right? Skull. I didn't plan this. I actually keep a skull here with pencil shavings inside, which I like. When Hamlet says to be or not to be, that is the question. The question isn't about a choice between being or not being, or acting or not, not acting. The question is, you can't be. Being feels like not being. And not being feels like being. It's a crack and we're stuck between it. It's an existential dilemma. Let me give you an example. Why is it that we're happiest when we're doing something that seems to have no point at all? Like, you're just having fun with your friends or you're climbing a mountain. There's no point, really, to climbing a mountain other than saying, I want to be on the top. And as soon as you're on the top, you want to be on the bottom. There's a great line from the writer Lydia Davis. She says, in life, our problems can seem so mountainous that sometimes it's comforting to climb an actual mountain. So there's that. Doing is easier than not doing. And there's something very pleasurable in doing something simply for the sake of doing it. I'm a very strong believer in this. The reason going for a walk like for my mental health is healthy is because you're not going to something. You're going for a walk. The walk itself is the point. When you're going up a mountain, the point is to be on top. Mountaineers, alpinists will tell you that 
The view <laughs> this is actually surprising. The view from the bottom of the mountain is actually more impressive than the view from the top of the mountain. You do it not for a reason. You do it because the thing itself provides its own reason. The goal of a good meal isn't to be satisfied. You don't, like, sure, you can say I'm stuffed. But let's say you go to a really fancy restaurant. You don't judge the restaurant by the extent to which you were sated by the end of it. No, you judge it by the extent to which you admire the complexity of the ingredients and the taste and the flavor and the palate. You admire it for the point of it. You don't admire it because you say, well, this gave me enough calories to get through another day of life. The things that are most meaningful to us don't serve a clear purpose. We do them for the sake of doing them. And that's what love is. To me, that's like the clearest definition of love. Love is not utilitarian. Love is something you do for the sake of doing it. It's its own point. In the same way that love defies types, right? We all have this idea that we have a type, especially when we're still in the realm of crush. Remember I said that crushing, verliebtheit, is like training wheels for love. And so we come up with lists of requirements that we have for people. They're not bad, but they're artificial, right? They're what we think love looks like. Love looks like blonde hair, or love looks like someone who wears Doc Martens or something like this. It's not bad. Remember, these are all training wheels for love. And then you fall in love, and you realize that you no longer have a type. The person you're with is now your type. They've become a type unto themselves. That's what love is. It shatters the idea and the preconceptions that you had about the types. And so the types were the training wheels. But once you're in love, you're off. And you're like, I don't want training wheels. Why would I ever want training wheels ever again? Love is something that you do for the sake of it. Love doesn't serve a purpose, and that's its purpose. Now, when Jizik says that love is disruptive, he means that love changes you. Love changes the way in which you view the world. There's something that Zizek once said about materialism and other theories that relate to the metaphysics of materialism, like Marxism, that one of the central insights of materialism, and I don't mean that in a consumer sense, but like the theory of materialism, is that things never are as they appear to us. But the manner in which we see them changes how they appear to us. In other words, that our subjective investment in something changes the nature of that thing. And it reveals us. The way in which we look at the world says more about us than it says about the world. And the same happens with love. Love changes you. It doesn't make you better. It might even make you worse. Love teaches you something about yourself that you couldn't learn by yourself. There's no manual for it. And so when Lacan, Jacques Lacan says that love is giving what you don't have, what he means is that what you don't have is knowledge of self. Your lack, your monk. You can't just be. The easiest way to know that you're in love is that you can no longer just be. You're not fine. You want to be with that other person. Suddenly that other person has become your favorite hello and your most painful goodbye. I experience that all the time. Like, why is it that when I eat food with my partner or watch a movie with my partner, it tastes better and the movie is funnier? I am more in life with the other person. Why is it that someone who was a stranger can now make me feel less stranger to myself, less estranged from myself? And yet, that's one of the mysteries of love. And so when Lacan says that love is giving what you don't have, it's that sense of, I am no longer okay by myself. I can't just be. 
and you give that to somebody else, in the same, you give what you have to someone who doesn't want it. In other words, the other person doesn't want your luck. The other person wants you to step into their lack. And so for Lacan, the definition of love, I know this is very cryptic, is two lacks that fulfill each other. Two minuses that create a plus. Two negatives that create a positive. Which is not to say that you need someone to complete you. This is something that I've always and will always argue against. If you want somebody else to complete you, then you are not ready for love. You need to find, I think this is something that Nietzsche even said. God knows Nietzsche is not a good guide when it comes to love. Don't find someone who completes you. Find someone who accepts you. It's as simple as that. But in order to not want someone to complete you, it means you have to accept yourself. And so you have to know yourself. Which means that the precondition for being accepted by somebody else means that you know how to accept yourself. And then you realize it's a tautology. It's essentially the idea that in order to be in love, you need to be self-loving, which everybody knows, and yet it's hard to do. And the best kind of love is a love that teaches you how to love yourself as if you were someone else. That you learn to look at yourself through the eyes of your partner. This is one of those maxims you've probably seen on the internet, a little bit self-helpy even, that we do more for others than we do for ourselves. That if a child walked up to you, your child walked up to you and was crying, we would comfort them. And so if we're crying inside, why don't we comfort ourselves? That we don't know how to comfort ourselves. And so we look to somebody else and learn how to love ourselves through the eyes of someone else. Which means that you have to first accept yourself and love yourself to then learn to love yourself as another self through the eyes of your loved one. And that's what Lacan means by taking your lack and giving it to someone who is also lacking. It goes back to the idea and the theme of vulnerability, that to be in love isn't to say that you're the strongest, that you're the hero, that you've rescued the princess from the castle. It's to say, I am vulnerable. I'm open to the pain you might inflict upon me, and I it's worth it. Now, speaking of pain, I want to wrap up by talking about one of my favorite themes, which is one of the central themes within existentialist thought, 20th century literature, poetry, art, all the bleeding hearts that went from romanticism to modernism. And it's the idea of melancholy. I actually personally believe that one of the weirdest things about the age we live in is that we don't talk about melancholy more. <laughs> because I think melancholy is something that happens to everybody. And melancholy is a double-edged sword. It can be very productive, very fruitful. It's like ambition, right? If you're ambitious, you can use different types of fuel. There's good fuel, like inspiration and wanting to help people and there's bad fuel like resentment and i don't know jealousy wanting to prove to other people that you can do it that's true for ambition but it's also true for melancholy melancholy can be productive it can create great works of art use very great sense but it can also be an abyss one of my absolute lines from Nietzsche is that if you stare too long into the abyss, the abyss stares back. And that's exactly what melancholy is. It's the abyss staring back at you in your own image. But first, let's define what is melancholy. I think my favorite definition of melancholy is falling in love with your own pain. Because if you make yourself vulnerable, if you're in love, whether it's requited or unrequited, it means that you probably will get hurt at some point. Anything worth doing can hurt you. Remember, this is the whole, I mean, this is why the two, okay, I know this is a bit dumb, but the two most important things in love are courage and trust. Because courage is in the absence of fear, as everybody knows. Courage is confronting a fear. And I think 
Our two most deepest fears are that we won't be loved and that we will be hurt. But the truth is that it is loving that will hurt you. And so in order to be able to love and be loved, you have to confront your fear of being hurt, which thereby eliminates the fear of love. That's the courage of love. Love is also trust. If we can't quantify love, if we can only qualify it, it means that love is something that you can't have proven to you. Remember, it's not competition, it's repetition. If love is saying, I believe that you love me by your actions, by your looks, by your touch, then love is about trust. And trust is inherently blind. Of course, we can build up trust. But trust is not proof. Trust is a kind of faith. Faith is not a very popular word anymore, but love is faith. You have to believe in love. You have to believe in your own love, and you have to believe in the love of the other person. As soon as you start trying to prove love, how much is it worth? How much are you worth to me? That is already the beginning of the end of love. There's a reason that when it comes to couples therapy, often one of the first exercises in couples undergoing divorce is to make a list of all the things you love about them. You have to write down the things you find lovable about the other person. You're already on the other side of love. And so melancholy is falling in love with your own pain. And here's the thing. When someone hurts you, when someone breaks up with you, or even if you break up with them, which is also painful, let's not forget. Because once you're in love, there is no, like, one-sided wound. All wounds are shared wounds. When you're hurt, it's really difficult to move on. This is something I've experienced myself, having gone through difficult breakups. When somebody hurts you, it means that they're suddenly out of your life. And the most painful thing about a breakup is that someone who is the most intimate person, the person you could tell anything, suddenly becomes a stranger. But of course, they're not a stranger. You have to pretend they're a stranger, which is weird and unnatural. And so someone went from being the person who was your everything to a person that you're not allowed to tell anything. And so you're in pain. You're hurting. You've lost something. And what people fear the most, I think this is really important, what people fear the most once they've been hurt is losing their loss. And melancholy is when you're afraid of losing your loss. Because think about it. Let's say that someone breaks up with you and you're in pain, a lot of pain, like an unreasonable amount of pain. It's like hard to eat. One of my absolute favorite lines, I think it's also from Goethe. He says that you haven't lived until you've cried into your own food. And that image is so true for me. It's like when you're really hurt, it's not performative. It's the kind of hurt that breaks through. Like you're eating and suddenly your tears flow right into your mouth. That kind of hurt, breakup hurt. We've all had it. It's makes you feel like you're an alien on another planet. It's like you're at work and you're just standing there and the work continues, but your life has stopped. Every breakup is a kind of death. It's a death of the person you want it to be. And so there's a mourning process. But the mourning process should be a mourning process because here's the thing. What does it look like to recover from a breakup? What does it look like to move on? Well, simply put, to move on is to basically say, I'm not hurting anymore. I loved you and I probably still love you, but I don't hurt. I'm not in pain. I'm ready to love someone else. The problem is that that means you're losing them twice. First, you lose them when they break up with you or when you break up with them. And then the second time, you lose them is when you say, I'm okay now. That's what people don't always realize about why it's so hard to recover from a breakup is because recovering from a breakup feels like a kind of betrayal because it used to be that your whole life was about this one person. And now it's like, I'm okay. I'm ready to move on. It almost feels like you're the you had. And 
so the melancholic, the definition of the melancholic is someone who's so afraid to lose their loss that they hold on to their own pain. And so they, they idolize their pain because they don't have the relationship, but at least they have the pain. And the pain becomes like a totemic object that proves how real the relationship was. There's a great line at the end of a fairly terrible movie, which is, um, or disappointing movie, which is the last installment of Peter Jackson's The Hobbit trilogy. And spoilers for The Hobbit, at least the movie version, because this is not in the book. Um, basically, there's a love triangle between Legolas and another elf princess and a dwarf. And the dwarf dies, and she is distraught. And the line is, it hurts. She says, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And he says, that's how you know it was real. And so we think that because it hurts, because we're in pain, it was just real. The other person just didn't know. Oh, they dumped me because they didn't think it was real, but I'm hurting this much, so I know it was real. And so you're holding on to your own pain. Because as long as you hold on to the pain, you feel like it was real. And that if you move on from your own pain, somehow, this deceptive, it feels like, Maybe it wasn't true. You're trapped. You're trapped in your own pain. It's a narcissistic attachment to your own pain. The funny thing is we think of narcissism as you look in the mirror and you think you look so beautiful. It's usually the other way around. You look in the mirror and you think, nobody is as wretched as I am. No one hurts the way I hurt. No one understands me. We don't fall in love with ourselves because we think that we're the most amazing. We fall in love with ourselves because we think we're the most wretched. And so what happens with melancholy is that we fall in love with our own pain because we're so afraid to lose that which we've already lost, to lose it a second time. And here we find what I think is the second meaning of the third thing. Love is always what comes after the second loss. Love is when you've loved and you've lost and you've learned to love again. To me, that's the definition of love. I know there's some people who fall in love they have a crush, they meet that person, they fall in love, and they live happily ever after. And I love those people and they make me happy because I wish that were true for everybody. But I don't think it's true for everybody. I think that life is a book with many chapters. And it's very hard to learn to turn the pages. And it's even harder to learn to turn the page on love. And yet, if love is something that teaches you, and that every time you've loved, it's better to have love than lost than not to have loved at all, then it means that once you've lost your love, and once you've built up the courage to lose the loss of love, which is the way to move on and to gain acceptance, which is to love yourself, that is when you are ready for another relationship. And so I think the process of melancholy isn't something to be avoided. It's actually something fruitful that teaches you something. Melancholy teaches you that even if someone breaks up with you, you have to break up with the idea of what the relationship was. You have to be able to move forward. And for my, to my mind, the most satisfying love that I've had from my own life, which doesn't have to be true for everyone, has always come after I've gone through a period that I thought I would never love again. This is exactly how love works. It's only when you think, I don't think I could ever do this to myself again, that love happens. And that's exactly when you're ready. It's when you're not chasing it. It's when you're not desperate. It's when you're not looking for someone to complete you. It's when you're realistic. And that's the thing about most wounds is that most wounds heal but there is some form of scar tissue. And you take that with you into your next relationship. And so for, for me, love is different from a crush. There's a difference between Liebe and Philippe type. Philippe type is safe. It's the you, it's the training wheels of love. But love is a risky proposition. And at the same time, life is a risky proposition. Everybody's heard this before that 
the only certainty in life is that it ends. That, as Plato famously said, or wrote, Socrates probably said it, is that life is simply learning how to die. If life is simply learning how to die, then for me, life is simply learning how to fall in love, which is how your previous life dies, the previous you, the person you thought you were. And that's scary, but it's also beautiful. For those of you asking if I will save this, I am indeed saving this on Instagram. And you can also download it as a podcast on Patreon. Okay, that is the first episode of the new lecture series on love and how to find it, otherwise called The Third Thing. It's going to be a 12-week series every Monday, 8 to 9 a.m. USAPT. I hope you'll join me for a live one-hour rumination, philosophical reflection on the theory and the various theories and approaches and ideas about love throughout psychoanalysis and philosophy and literature and poetry and art. I love doing this. Um, if you'd like to join for the entire course, please do consider becoming a patron. If you'd like to learn more about love, if you'd like to reflect on love and, and hopefully gain some value from that, click the link in my bio. Um, starts at $5 a month, gets you access to the bonus podcast, the Q&A where I answer your questions every single week. If you'd like to ask me a question about love, you can do that on Patreon. In about five minutes, I'm going to be recording the live Q&A podcast. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask me, simply sign up to the $5 tier and I'll get you all set up. Um, if you'd like to have every lecture as an audio download, digital access to transcripts, uh, an ebook version soon, etc. please do consider being a patron. It starts at $5 a month. It really, really, really helps because that way I can keep doing this. I feel so lucky that I get to share this with you guys around the world. It's really precious to me. I hope that it's valuable for you. Um, there's a lot of things that I've learned and that I've thought about and that I hope will provide you guys with. And I think that I've probably, it's hard for me to admit this, but I've probably spent more time thinking about love than about anything in the world. There's been many times that I've gone for long walks without even wanting to think about it, thinking about it. So if you are in that mindset, I hope that you will enjoy this lecture series. Uh, does this new lecture series relate to the old one? Yes, absolutely. I remember the old lecture series was uh, mostly about Jacques Lacan, the French psychoanalyst, and Slavoj Žižek, um, the Slovenian philosopher. And a lot of those ideas will continue into this series. So if you are interested in the ebook from the previous lecture series, it's called Where Nothing is Lacking. That's currently available on Patreon. And I'll talk about that in another live stream, but the full set, the four intro to Zizek books, those are gonna be coming very soon. So um, on that note, thank you guys so much. Please do consider joining next week, Monday, 8 a.m. for another lecture on love. And if you'd like to join the entire course, please do consider becoming a patron. It starts at just $5 a month. Um, it really makes a massive difference in keeping this project alive. All right, on that note, I love you all. And I will see you guys in five minutes on Discord for the patron-only Q&A. All right. Thanks, guys. Anybody who signs up now, I'll send you a message in the next couple of minutes. Make sure you're all signed up. All right. Bye, guys. And thank you to YouTube. Uh, next week, we will have a slightly better setup because Jenlene will be back. Jenlene is currently in Canada on a yoga retreat. And, and she will be back with us next week. And she will help us set up YouTube on her phone. So it will hopefully look a little bit better. On that note, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. And I hope to see you in the Q&A. All right. Bye, guys.